Hello, everyone. This is Kai Reaver calling in from Oslo, Norway. I've tried recording this about six or seven times with a few different formats, and I think I've found the best one. So rather than read from a script, I've decided to do this like a lecture. And while I unfortunately cannot be there physically, I do still hope if you have any questions or concerns that you send me an email so that I can try to process some of the feedback. Uh, also, uh, later this year, I will be attending the AMPS conferences in London and in Canterbury, and I will be developing some of this research and the arguments I'm presenting then. So I do hope to see you all, and uh, again, I'm sorry I couldn't be there today. Uh, and I hope you're having a nice conference. So without further ado, uh, I'd like to present this Paper. Digital zoning. In the age of surveillance capitalism, can urban planning help regulate technology? The first topic for discussion is technology regulation. It seems apparent that we need more robust frameworks and arguments for how to regulate technology. As an architect, it's becoming increasingly apparent that some of the ways in which we've learned how to regulate physical space could be applicable to technology today. This becomes increasingly apparent within the development of so-called smart cities. While smart cities like to portray themselves as being these digital utopias, there are increasing concerns from a broad uh, range of researchers that these smart cities could actually be totalitarian surveillance apparatus. And that's certainly something we would like to avoid. At the same time, it seems that the political motivation to develop the smart city could be a great way to mobilize further democracy and participation within urban environments. So it seems important to be able to harness this political ambition to look how we could solve this problem. This is required, for me at least, to merge several different disciplines. Coming from architecture, I've had to look into urbanism and interaction design and further into augmented and virtual reality, 3D scanning, these sorts of technical fields, but also to look more into the history of philosophy and of democracy, and more importantly, to look at city planning and some of the foundational arguments for city planning. This is becoming increasingly necessary when looking at how some cities have begun to develop so-called tech-free spaces. This seems to be articulating a context in which we need to have a more broad and coherent framework for regulating technology in physical space. And finally, it seems that the best way to do this is through prototyping. So I've been developing various applications in augmented and virtual reality to be used within urban planning and also, uh, I've been looking at how prototypes for so-called regulation of physical spaces and the digital services that can be conducted within them. All of this should give us policy guidelines so we can talk to politicians and industry actors about how we could help regulate technology in physical space. But secondly, to develop design methods as it seems that the design disciplines need a broader framework both for working with new technology applications, but also in how to design ethically responsible services that fit within a regulatory framework intended for a democratic society. This first image was taken by the American street photographer, Gary Winogrand. One of the reasons I like to show this image is because of the incredible high quality of interaction between the people in this urban street scene. I like to contrast this 1964 image with an image like this, which could probably be taken in any urban environment in the world today. And I think one of the things that we are beginning to notice is that whatever's going on inside of these phones is probably attempting to augment or mimic or replace 
some of those very rich interactions from the previous image. So I'd like to ask a further question, is whether or not an image like this would be possible to take today, and whether or not that is a good or a bad thing. The American scholar Shoshana Zuboff writes in Surveillance Capitalism about how this novel economic force has started to overtake our private lives. Without going too deep into her research that I highly, highly recommend you read, there is this foundational concern that surveillance capitalism erodes the very possibility of a democratic society. Interestingly, it seems that the technology industry itself has begun to ask for its own regulation. On the left, Apple's Tim Cook, and on the right, Microsoft President Brad Smith. And simultaneously, we see a political ambition to regulate technology companies. This is Elizabeth Warren's political platform where she's suggesting to break up the monopolies of Amazon, Google, and Facebook. And the question I'd like to ask is what other forms of regulation could be applicable to these technologies? This is especially important when looking at current technological development. On the left, we have facial recognition. On um, the middle, we have AR glasses. And on the right, we have smartphone tracking. All of this represents technology becoming increasingly a part of our physical worlds. This is Facebook's memory project. What it does is it uses private photographs to reconstruct 3D models of interior environments. Through a technology called photogrammetry, it triangulates and compares imagery and reconstructs them. This allows us to speculate that Facebook could be in possession of the largest 3D model of private space in the world. Some of these concerns come even further when looking at the smart city. What the smart city asks us to do is to layer technology on top of the existing urban environment. As an architect, I would argue that the problems of the city and of urbanism have very little to do with the need for a new layer of technology, but rather with the holistic understanding of what the city is in and of itself and how to look coherently and robustly at the various ways in which it is designed. This becomes increasingly apparent when looking at things like 5G, which are kind of the infrastructural engines for getting the smart city to work. One of the things that 5G says it will do is to enable huge amounts of different location-based services and applications. This becomes increasingly precise through so-called millimeter accuracy that industry reports say that 5G will have. So with smartphones today through 5G and GPS, we have about three to five meters of accuracy between where a phone is and where it thinks it is. This means that with 5G, the phone will know exactly where it is, where it is. Back in 2013, Google tech executives, Eric Schmidt and Jared Cohen, wrote that the internet is the largest experiment involving anarchy in history. And that hundreds of millions of people are each minute creating and consuming an untold amount of digital content in an online world that is not truly bound by terrestrial laws. I would argue against that claim and say that within these technological developments, technology is bound by terrestrial laws. And thinking about the word terrestrial, of course, we can see how these relate to land or the planet Earth. So how do we regulate technology in physical space? This is an infrastructure put together by the Norwegian mapping authority, Kartverke. What they've done is they've taken urban planning data of the various zones of the city, this is in Oslo outside of parliament, and overlaid them with an augmented reality infrastructure within the city. You can see here how tightly woven the various property boundaries within this augmented reality interface are with 
the movement within the city. We've just passed between two different zones, zone for two different uses, and in a very precise manner, uh, connected to the physical space that the phone is walking within. This, I believe, shows some of the capabilities of augmented reality and positioning to create a more robust regulatory framework for technology. Some of the forms of this terrestrial law that we have in the Nordic region, which also applies to most of the West, are things like planning regulation, building permits, specialist juries, public hearings, preservation and listing in open competitions. All of these things are form of regulation that are used within the physical environment. All of this goes back quite a long ways. Aristotle writes of Hippotamus, both the first city planner and also the first political philosopher. Hippotamus designed the prototypical city of Miletus for 10,000 inhabitants. Here, he made three zones of space, private, public, and religious. And also, to facilitate this continuous evolution of democracy, he invented the space of the Agora, which was to be big enough to house all of the city's inhabitants. Within the Agora, two new words and two new spatial uses developed. Agorazo, to shop, and agora oe, to speak in public. So we see here the evolution of democracy as a political project being directly instantiated with the development of the city. For this reason, the understanding of what type of city we want and what kind of democratic principles should be embodied within it have a direct relationship between the regulation and the use of space. These are the typical phases of planning in a building proposal today. Often it'll move from an ideas competition in the beginning through regulation into construction and out the other end through either a heritage proposal which allows for a building's protection or its eventual demolition. One of the things I've been developing here in Norway is then practice-oriented models for how to use innovative technology in these urban planning procedures. In regulation plans, we've been developing an infrastructure in augmented reality to allow us to display accurate planning data on site at physical scale. This allows us to understand what a building would mean in physical space and to make more democratic and participatory decisions about those buildings before they are built. What's important about this is that it's within the existing legal framework for city planning today. Additionally, by using some of the advantages of server software, we can iterate between various different proposals. This could offer users the ability to choose between proposals and to cast a vote, for example. And this type of possibility really opens up some of these rather dry bureaucratic procedures. So while staying within the regulatory framework we have today, we can open up new possibilities. By exposing these types of technologies to students, they've been given the chance not only to learn how to design more efficiently, but also how to participate in a broader discourse with the public and intended users. When coming to something like the construction period, we've been looking at how to use virtual reality to simulate various aspects of the building before it is built and how to integrate users into their design. By using primitive one-to-one -one mock-ups of various aspects of a building and simulating the rest digitally in a virtual environment, we can also take more robust decisions about a building from a larger group of participants. Finally, when coming to something like a heritage proposal, it's often very difficult to navigate the difficult decision of whether to demolish a building or to preserve it. One way we've been able to use photogrammetry and 3D scanning alongside virtual reality is to allow people to discuss uh, the demolition of a building, but also to create 
a digital backup of a building before it is demolished. This has been used quite recently with the Nordic Pavilion in Venice, Italy. The Nordic Pavilion is, of course, in a very precarious state due to climate change and frequent flooding in Venice. And here we've used a combination of 3D scanning and virtual reality to create a digital backup of the building, which is allowing us to simulate various temporary exhibitions and other uh, changes to the building, while at the same time allowing us to create a virtual backup of the building in its current state and use that to engage with heritage experts on making difficult decisions about the future of the building. So this is from the virtuality backup of that building. This goes hand in hand with developing regulatory policies for technology in urban space, focusing on user privacy, surveillance, and urban governance. As I've spoken of earlier, zoning is the process in which we regulate the physical boundaries of space and give them an intended use, such as private, public, or mixed use. What I'm interested in is pairing that with a technology known as geofencing, which is a virtual perimeter for a real world geographic area. These geofences are used quite commonly when renting something like a bicycle. With 5G, of course, these geofences can become incredibly precise. My guess is that they will be equally precise as a zoning plan, and eventually we'll be able to put these two types of methods together. This seems increasingly important when looking at things like virtual reality. Some of the legal precedents from how virtual images should be regulated is that it's not whether an image is digital, it's whether or not the users understand them as real or fake. And this seems to generate relatively robust legal precedents for discussing how such digital zoning could function. And all of this seems to be increasingly needed out in the world. Here in Hobart, Tasmania, the director of city innovation, Peter Carr, is looking at how to create tech-free areas in the city. Here he's looking at how a park can turn off Wi-Fi and 4G for personal and social well-being. In San Francisco, we've recently seen the banning of facial recognition. And this is interesting, of course, because it seems that areas of high technological expertise also seem to be enforcing the highest levels of technology regulation. And here in London, the Design Festival recently experimented with a tech-free cafe. <laughs> Excuse me. So here in Norway, we've been looking at how to collaborate with policy officials, designers, artists, and industry experts to design so-called digital agoras. How to create zones that have a physical boundary, but also a digital policy? And what would it be like for digital services to transition between those zones? These are what these workshops look like, where we're gradually building up various experimental areas within Oslo, where we can test out different prototypes for how these types of services could work. These are some of the values inscribed within this digital agora. How do we begin to look at policy not to harvest anyone's data while using public space? How do we use geofencing to create different zones of data access? And how do we look at data as a common city wealth and a new set of ethics? The second component of that act, experimentation goes along with testing out various types of hardware that allow us to jam various different signals of the internet. Of course, these are brute force methods that are not as robust as we would need them to be in a future urban governance scenario. What we likely need is for 5G to be understood as a public infrastructure that could be legally governed by local city councils and officials. So while this research continues, I think we're opening up a really broad and interesting territory for further inquiry. And I do hope that this talk has illuminated some of the points of discussion and some of the research that we're doing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it.